It works. <laughs> the, jazz the jazz hands. I'm glad there's so much liveliness in the hall. We've started, we started early and we're going to finish dead on time. Now, I'm not going to be rude, but if our speakers go beyond their allotted time, particularly Jane, who's warned me, I'm going to say, Jane, you have five minutes. And Jane's going on first. Anyway, thank you all for being here. Hope you've had a, a good day on your visits and that the first part of your final workshop has been good too. We're here on the 4th of July. It's a momentous day in history. The American Declaration of Independence was signed on this day, and that changed the world order. I don't know if you know, but in, uh, in the UK, it's our general election day, which hopefully, hopefully, will change what's been happening in our country for the better and improve our relationship with Europe and the entire world. <laughs> now, and bring us more freedom. Now, I'll just give you a quote, and uh, it's for you to discover where this quote is from. But the quote is, use your freedom to serve one another in love which I think is a really good, a really good uh, quote. And I think it encapsulates what we try all as public servants to, to do with our lives, to use our freedom to serve one another in love. And that's one of the responsibilities of freedom. And July the 4th is uh, also a day in which we're gathered together in Barcelona from the USA, from all around Europe to listen and learn with the prospect tonight of a free evening where you can do whatever you want. But before that, <laughs> we have two excellent expert speakers. I'm going to introduce Jane first, Jane Mulcahy, research fellow working on the award-winning Greetown project at the University of Limerick, Graduated with her PhD in law from University College Cork on the topic of post-release supervision with long sentence male prisoners. And the research I was very glad to see was co-funded by the Irish Research Council and the Probation Service. You've worked as a researcher in lots of areas of criminal justice since 2005. Interestingly, she hosts a podcast called Law and Justice, so you can catch up with her there, and was uh, awarded a Justice Media Award. Uh, and you've been recording a special YouTube series of Law and Justice called How to Talk Policy and Influence People. And just one little characteristic of uh, Jane that uh, not a lot of people know, but she's a hot yoga practitioner, a hot yoga practitioner. <laughs> She's a practitioner of hot yoga. <laughs> Over to you, Jay. It's my gun out. Thank you, John, for that uh, <laughs> glorious introduction. Um, okay, so now uh, I'm totally nervous and getting hotter by the second. Um, I, I have too many slides, as I always, always do, but I'm going to talk to you guys a bit about um, rethinking resilience, because we've discussed a lot about what does it mean, what might it mean, what does it mean to us in various contexts, and I'm going to focus a little bit on youngsters, so under 18s, but really everything applies to adults too, um, because my main focus was male offenders until about three years ago. And we're gonna look at state-dependent functioning, which has sort of come up in some of the workshops, although the phrase mightn't have been used, and um, relational health as well. Um, so who am I? 
in addition to being a hot yoga practitioner, I am many things. I'm a mom, I have a husband, um, I have kids. Uh, well, yeah, because I'm a mom. Um, I'm a sister, I'm a researcher. I used to do theater. Um, I have the podcast. I do movement medicine because the body is central to all of this. Um, I do holotropic breath work and um, I'm an energetic field as all of you are. So that sounds a bit hippie, um, but it's not because we do carry our energy into the room with us. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can vary, it can be stressed. And, um, but whatever energy we have, it can be contagious for good or ill. So I'm gonna to touch on these things, attachment, um, interpersonal neurobiology, which is kind of how our relationships and environment makes us who we become. And uh, state dependent functioning, as I said, that's basically how our inner world, our nervous system has a huge impact as well and how we meet circumstances around us. And it, it impacts our IQ. So our IQ drops as our nervous system gets more overwhelmed. Um, polyvagal theory then is about safety, how safe we feel in our environment. And you'll notice I'm nervous, okay? And that's fine because it, it's kind of a big deal to be here. Um, and by, by naming it, maybe I will tame the nerves. Let's see, they might get worse. That's okay too. So relational health then, that is about how um, the state of our relationships impact our health, our well-being, our uh, capacity to learn and our capacity to change our behavior for, in a positive way. And I would invite you, as you've been invited in all the other workshops really, to tune into your own experience. If I annoy you, notice that if I say something that's some way aggravating because uh, I, I tend not to script anything ever and so that comes with certain risks that I might say something that doesn't land well with someone so what sensations do you feel do you just want to go get a beer do you just want to go swimming um are you feeling tense somewhere and why might that be um dis-ease I prefer rather than disease because it means that there's a lack of ease in the body for some reason. So can you soften something? Can you let go? And um, we're not always meant to be comfortable. You know, certainly with growth, we've heard there's an element of discomfort in growth. So embrace certain uncomfortable feelings from time to time. These are just some links to some of the research I've done. Um, I knew nothing really about trauma until my PhD and uh, I found out that it's kind of everywhere in prison and you don't have to be a psychologist to hear about it very quickly. Um, but you might not recognize its significance in terms of people's um, behavior and just the way they meet the world, how they meet other people, how they expect to be treated, whether they're capable of trust, whether they're capable of feeling um, that they're lovable. Most of them don't believe they're lovable at all. And that's pretty sad. Today in the institution where they had um, special supports for people with intellectual disabilities, a man said, I feel loved here. And I nearly cried because you don't hear that much in these kind of places. Uh, Jose was his name. So you guys, if you're practitioners, are your own best tools. You, you know, no risk assessment tool is better than you guys but you're also your own worst enemies potentially. So just a teach a bit about attachment because I probably wish we're done for half my time already. Um, yeah, we're mammals. We need touch, we need attunement, we need care, just like these guys. Um, to survive from predators, we need our caregivers to mind us. Normally that's our mom and our dad. So it's exactly the same. We need eye contact serve and return interactions, babies need to be held a lot. That's their main need. They need love and attunement 
and nurturance care more than they need food, actually. Um, so this is the key point, actually, I think. Resilient children are made and not born. We've discussed it. Resilience isn't something we intrinsically have. We all have the capacity for it, but only if the right conditions are there when we're tiny. Now, we can also build it as adults, but it's much better if we have the, the attuned, nurtured caregiving um, that I referred to, because babies are hugely malleable, especially in the first two to three months of life. And that's not even talking about what goes on in the womb in terms of stress during pregnancy. We're not going to even go there because the brain comes online when babies are born and it, their brains then develop very much in the context of those close relationships. So if they're safe, if they're picked up, if they're loved, they're, they're going to be set up for a good life. Whereas if they're not for some reason, it's going to become much more difficult for them. Now, you do need to take the wider social context into account. So if you are uh, born into a highly stressed community where there's wars, where there's bombing, where houses are exploding all around your mom, how is she meant to be highly attuned to your needs? Uh, survival will take precedence. And poverty is, um, is a big issue for, for many people. Bruce Perry is one of the uh, leading lights in child psychiatry, and uh, he wrote a book with Oprah Winfrey. I interviewed him, very cool guy. And um, basically, the world does not understand the importance of early infancy and doesn't understand enough the importance of nurturing care for babies. And we don't take care of pregnant women and new moms enough, and we don't put in place the conditions for family life to thrive enough. Um, but if they don't, basically, basically if babies don't get these nurturant experiences at the right time, they're already set up for difficulties in later life. State dependent functioning then, and a very swift um, kind of hand model of the brain. Do you, do you guys know Dan Siegel? Does anyone here, a few people would know. So the hand model of the brain is really good for all of us. Um, like children can understand this concept really well. So the brain stem down here is our survival brain, the reptilian brain. It's our autonomic nervous system is governed by this. So kind of sleeping, excretion, sexual drives all down here. It's, it's our base, base instincts that we've no control over. This part then under my thumb, is the attachment brain or the limbic system it used to be called. And that only comes online after we're born. So it's extremely experience dependent and it covers, covers like our emotions and how we, um, how we feel about our world and about the people in it. This part is the neocortex, my fingers. That's the rational thinking part of the brain. The part that makes us human but um, when we're frightened, when we're overwhelmed, we can flip our lids and the rational thinking part of the brain is surplus to requirements. If we feel we're threatened, that we're gonna die, that we're being humiliated, uh, then even the best CBT program in the world isn't going to help us when we feel that autonomic nervous system threat. The thing about state dependent functioning then is we can have a really high IQ, okay? Any of us can be really smart. And then my slides go to shit, they disappear. I don't know what I'm gonna say next. And my capacity to talk diminishes and I get even more flustered and confused. And um, all of a sudden I feel, oh my God, I'm so humiliated. What are people gonna think? My IQ is dropping before your very eyes. It doesn't mean I'm more stupid, but in the moment, yes, I actually am because it's a low level threat, a very low level threat. But if someone grows up in a world where they're always in high level threats, then they are not gonna function in the way that we would like them to. Okay, so neural, how am I doing for time, John? 18 minutes, 18 minutes wow, <laughs> amazing. Time is, time is slowing down here for me big time. The arousal continuum, it's, it's, it's amazing. 
So anyway, um, yeah, the still face experiment is super for giving you a sense of what babies need from their caregivers. And what it basically is, is moms who normally are smiley are instructed to not smile at their babies and the babies freak out very quickly. And it's, it kind of mimics depression. So babies who depressed moms, um, they don't develop the neural pathways and synapses and don't develop the delight in human contact that babies who have responsive caregivers do. And this is not about blaming depressed moms or anything like that. Um, but disorganized attachment is a feature of prison populations and probation populations. And what does that mean? Well, it means that people aren't going to feel like they're intrinsically good. They're not going to feel that other people are fundamentally trustworthy. Because if they've grown up in a household where their dad has beaten their mother and the mother has been frightened and unresponsive and just trying to survive, well, their needs have never really been important. They haven't been cherished. They haven't felt safe. There's been cortisol and all these other stress hormones pumping through them the whole time. And they meet the world as if everyone really is a predator. And that's a hard way to be in the world because then when they meet helpers, it's like, well, why should I trust you? You're an authority figure. All the authority figures I've ever met, including my teachers, have been mean and hostile and rejected me. So that's kind of what you're dealing with. And overwhelming stress um, will just change the way the brain develops. So there's nothing wrong with the brain when the baby is born, but over time, the wear and tear and the wiring of these stressed neurons together just means that it becomes uh, manipulated in a way that's not pro-social actually, because we are wired as humans to connect. We need to connect as a species in order to survive. That's still true. Like our, our nervous systems brought us together in order to collaborate, in order as small hunter-gatherer groups to be able to survive um, other predators and other tribes and stuff. But if we don't develop these basic skills, then we look at one another as if we're not allies and it's every man or woman for themselves. A study, um, this is very significant. I think from 1998, there's been lots of replications, but it was done with 17,000 mainly white, mainly middle-class people with private health insurance. And um, what they found was that childhood adversities are really common. The more of them that cluster together, the worse the health outcomes. So if you have four or more of these adversities, so things like um, a mentally ill family member, mainly a, a parent, I, um, would be the worst case scenario, really. Uh, separation or divorce of parents, um, alcoholism or drug use in the home, domestic violence in the home, it, um, child sexual abuse or child physical abuse or neglect, emotional neglect, emotional abuse. I'd like to say something about emotional neglect. Um, it's really common. We don't respect emotions and it's been really good here that we've spoken about them so much because we unduly associate emotions with children and women and do everyone a huge disservice by this because men aren't allowed to feel them or they're not allowed to feel soft and vulnerable and women aren't allowed to feel angry and watch their boundaries. And really we need to feel the whole range of them because they are messages from our bodies about how safe we feel around other people. So we need to fundamentally rehabilitate emotions for all of us and emotional neglect is extremely harmful uh, for human beings so if your parents do some work on that if you think you need to you know in honoring them it's not about overly indulging them either it's just about knowing that you're getting messages and they mean something and they're important um but heart disease cancer stroke um breathing problems obesity, drug use, all of these, um, you're going to have a higher risk of developing them if you've had four or more adverse childhood experiences. 
statistically, and this has been repeated over time. And certain groups are more likely to have more adversities than others, including people who end up in prison or on probation. People who are poor, people who are ethnic minorities, women are more likely to have them because the experience of women and girls in the world with misogyny has rendered us more vulnerable. Oh. Cited out there. Uh, so memory templates. Our experiences of attachment, we bring with us everywhere we go, whether we know it or not. And um, so depending on our experiences of our moms or dads or whoever cared for us, um, we're going to bring them into the office as workers. You know, if we've had very stern caregivers as a professional, we might be more punitive ourselves and expect more, be, be a bit more harsh when people don't measure up. Um, if we've had secure attachments and a lot of love and we feel quite loving towards others, we're going to find it easier to bring that into the room with us too. And all we need to be, though, is good enough, right? So perfectionism has been mentioned a lot. That is a trauma response, lads. You know, um, now I'm not saying it's not good to want to do a high job, uh, the best job that you can, but if it's pathological for you, if you can't let it go, it's, it, it can be um, indicative of maybe only getting attention as a child by overachieving, by getting the best results in the class. As a parent, good enough is good enough. You only need to be responsive to your baby or your child a bit more than 50% of the time. No one is going to be perfect. I think that's very important. As a mom, you know, we beat ourselves up a lot. Dad's less, so I think they get away with a lot. But um, they're also hugely important. I'm not saying that dads are not important. A lot of their job is supporting the moms and also supporting kids to, to play and explore. So it's a very important role as well. The lick your pups point again is about the importance of touch. Babies and small children need to be touched. Um, we all need it. You know, not everyone loves hugs but they're actually quite healing at times. And um, yeah, so we only need to be good enough. And I would say as workers, you only need to be good enough as well. Um, that, that is plenty to strive for. How am I doing on time? 10 minutes. Wow, <laughs> I still only have about a hundred slides. So <laughs> we're getting there. Polyvagal theory, health, growth, restoration. So our bodies need to feel safe in the presence of each other. And a, a lot of that is an unconscious thing. Hopefully, you, look, you guys look kind of safe here. You're not too bored looking. Um, at this hour of the day, I'm doing quite well, I feel, uh, you know, because it's been tiring. But we don't know when we walk into a space, are we going to feel safe there or not? There are loads of things that might derail us in that, you know, if we can't really understand the language. Um, imposter syndrome is rife, where we think, I don't really belong there. It might be full of academics, or I'm not a prison officer. What will they think of me? Um, but the point about this is, with the population that people work with, people have never felt safe really often a day in their lives. From the, the day they were conceived, possibly, but certainly the day they've been born, many have not felt this visceral sense of safety around other people. And what that means then is that the bodies are very tight a lot of the time, if they're hyper aroused and looking for threat everywhere, or they might be very disconnected and numb and they're nearly harder to work with if they're really almost not alive and the energy is so low, um, that, can, that, can, that can be very difficult because it seems like there's no motivation to do anything else. Um, but really, it's a very much a shutdown kind of um, almost like death failing response is what Stephen Porges would call it. So he's a brilliant um, neurobiologist who I've done some training with and I've also interviewed. Very cool guy. Um, he came up with this term called neuroception. And it's a bit like perception, but perception is conscious thinking. Whereas neuroception is the body's unconscious detection of, of threat or safety in the environment. Really important because 
no CBT program can prepare you in advance for are you going to feel viscerally safe or unsafe in a given situation. You can talk, you can think, you can plan, you can um, mull over possible scenarios that you might find yourself in, but it's a visceral, completely autonomic, automatic process that the mind has no control over, really. At least that's what this guy, um, Porges, would say. And many of the psychotherapists who apply his theory would agree that it's, um, it's below the uh, prefrontal cortex that governs our conscious thought. So if we have this sense of safety in our body and we feel safe around other people, we can learn. We can learn new things. We can cooperate. We can do group work. We can have fun in groups. But if we feel endangered for whatever reason, like if we're LGBT or something and we walk into a room and we're waiting to hear, is someone going to say something rotten or, or we're a person who's black and we've had every day of our lives this fear and dread of racism, it's hard working, walking into certain rooms and we need to be aware of these things if we're working with, with people with certain identity issues or factors from their, um, from their lives. So it's really important if you're working with diverse communities to tune into this. There's, there's inequity everywhere. White people do not go around the world the same way that black people do. Um, men do not know what it's like to feel like a woman in, in um, dark streets. They cannot imagine it. Most women in the audience, I'm sure, know what I mean about this, just the fear of men is, it's intergenerational and for good reason. Um, so this is the pair of aces. Wendy Ellis is a wonderful African-American public health specialist. And she wanted to bring together the individual adversities with the wider community ones because individuals and families live in communities and some communities are more stressed and strained and oppressed and failed by the system and the state than others. So Nadine Burke Harris, she's written a great book called The uh, Deepest Well. She was the Surgeon General of California and she says that um, trauma and adversity in some communities is endemic. It's encoded in the kind of DNA of society. Um, it's not just from person to person, household to household. It's, it's kind of everywhere, it seeps everywhere. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not all individual. It's not all bad individual or family choices. It is intergenerational though, and it's also cultural and historical. So in Ireland, we had the troubles in Northern Ireland. We had the famine. Uh, we had a lot of sexual abuse by priests. We shoved all these pregnant women into Magdalen laundries, stole their babies, sent them off to America. Adoption is a trauma. Um, even where the adoptive family is really welcoming and loving, the rupture, that visceral rupture, is not well understood in society. Um, so there's many traumas in Ireland. Spain has plenty of its own. Most countries do. Colonization across the world has had huge impacts that we don't reckon with in the here and now. But there's a need actually to do healing at a mass level, because the world right now is kind of a bit scary and in tatters. And a lot of it is because there's so much undigested, unprocessed trauma and disconnection from one another. Yeah, uh, this is just a quote. If any of you are interested in um, reading my fascinating, endlessly long PhD, uh, <laughs> it's available. Um, but, you know, we, we set people up for failure by putting them in homeless situations with no supports and expecting them to do the impossible, to be attuned and loving caregivers when they're just trying to stay alive, really. And, um, and often things like mental health problems or suicide, it's an attempt at a solution when there's, there's no longer any hope there. Um, so addiction as well is, uh, I think, helpfully understood as an attempt at a solution. But Vincent Felitti says it's hard to get enough of something that doesn't quite work. It works for a while. It takes the edge off. It numbs. Um, but you can never get enough. 
if you're not dealing with the root of the problem. So this is just a nice quote about the, um, the inequity in the world and that ACEs cluster. It's not like lots of people have them in this room. Th there's plenty of adversity, but we also have far better resources for dealing with it. The, the real difficulty is when people have no resources, they have no social connections, they can't trust, they can't accept the help that's being offered to them. Um, I'd say of two minutes, two minutes, right. So uh, yeah, so I think addiction, this is a great quote from Daniel Sumrock. It's a natural response to trauma and adversity. It's not an unnatural um, bad choice. It's a natural predictable outcome of trauma and abuse. So it's an important reframe, I think, to normalize it. Now that's not saying keep going, lads, keep, keep taking the drugs because they're destroying you. But it's important to understand the function, the, the good that's gotten out of it for the person, even if ultimately it has turned out to be disastrous. The question we should have is not why the addiction, but why the pain. Gabor Mate, another absolute legend. Um, and he says that not everyone who's addicted was traumatized, but everyone that is addicted um, has been traumatized. I think that's true. I was talking to Lily about this video, Step Inside the Circle and the Compassion Prison Project um, way of bringing information about trauma and ACEs to prisoners. I've had the pleasure of doing it in Edinburgh Prison with Fritzi and doing the circle multiple times now. It's very powerful. I need to wrap it up. It's not enough, though, to just know about trauma. We, uh, we really have to try and help people heal. And depending on their, their cultural background, um, we need to harness the strengths of the cultures that they have. So if they're indigenous people, that culture is really important. If they're African-American, we need to find the, the strengths of that culture. Or if they're travelers in Ireland and love horses, we need a way in because oftentimes these cultures have been desecrated and um, try to push them aside because they're, they're not sophisticated. They don't fit with the Western mentality, but actually they have a lot of potential for healing. And there's a lot of wisdom in indigenous practices around rhythm and dancing and coming together in, in a collective that we as individualized people in the West could really badly learn from. So healing-centered engagement, I think, is a lovely model and um, it, it brings together the strengths that young people have, but also draws in the positive restoration of identity through culture or whatever else is relevant to them. Just a, a, a couple of tiny points, John, if, if I may, on um, the Greentown program. I, I wanted to talk about what hard to reach meant because these are young people who deal drugs in gangs and what we found is there's very high levels of childhood trauma and intergenerationally, their families have had a lot of trauma. Um, maternal depression, very common. Domestic violence, very common. Low levels of trust, you know, don't want to deal with services. Every service they've ever come across has kind of labeled them as hard to reach. Um, they're not well served by the services that have been offered to them. There's huge ongoing issues in the home like housing, mental health, suicide, cancer, so um, drug deaths. So really talking about uh, why their son is dealing drugs is the least of their worries. It's actually, they're, they're so swamped with just trying to survive that trying to do ther therapy with them is really challenging. Um, and they don't feel safe around people they're totally emotionally all over the place, explosive, like some of the, the men in the, um, the, the unit this morning. Learned helplessness, a lot of drug deaths, gambling, um, difficulties in imagining a different future. No hope, can't imagine being anywhere else. Um, not very open to personal development opportunities, even when they could do anything that we would and we'll give them money to do something they can't they can't even imagine that because they're stuck they're stuck in the overwhelm and you have to be safe in order to imagine something else you've got to have a certain level of stability in order to kind of go oh 
I might actually like to do creative writing or join a drama group or try hot yoga or whatever it is. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. The point is that you can imagine something other than being on the street corner. Um, yeah, and the return to network related offending behavior even after graduating is very common. Death is also common, sadly, like bereavement um, among their peer group and family members. What appears to be working, I'm, I'm, I'm done now, um, is that the burden of connecting with these guys and their families has to be on the workers. It's not, we, we can't be expecting the most hard to reach to come knocking in our doors and say, please help me. Listening is so important. Listening to what they're actually saying and saying is important to me right now. The meeting them where they're at, very important. Therapeutic case management, it's basically kind of um, uh, doing what needs to be done. So if you have a missing front door on your house, getting you a new front door. If you have no food, getting you food. Um, advocating for, for children and families, bringing people to the services and taking time and being realistic. Consistency and persistence, vital. <laughs> Safety, belonging and opportunities. So somehow managing to increase the felt sense of safety that the child and the family have. Um, whatever that means in their context, it might be helping them pay off a drug debt or helping them move out of the area. Attending to rupture and repair. Some of you might know what that means. It's kind of, we all mess up all the time. We hurt each other. We get things wrong. Saying sorry is important. Um, particularly if you're in a power position and you don't do something that you say you'll do, it's important that you try and repair that because they're not used to that type of uh, relational exchange. Um, Interagency collaboration and that type of thing, never giving up, you know, no matter how many mistakes they make, no matter how many times they relapse, no matter how many times they go back to the network. And minding the staff, you know, we've been talking about that here because the staff are doing tremendous work under extremely stressful circumstances. So trying to keep them safe and well. I'm done. And I, I thank you. You did well, Jen. Right, thank you very much for that. Jane's going to have a, a well-deserved sit down and a rest <laughs> now, and I bet you're glad you went on first. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Madeline Petrillo, who's going to be talking about trauma-informed work in prison and probation. And despite her name, she comes from Rochdale in, in Lancashire, which is just down the road from where I live. I never knew. <laughs> but as soon as we spoke, we knew. Uh, she's an associate professor in criminology at the University of Greenwich, professionally qualified as a probation officer. He'd worked on the program as a program leader on the uh, qualification of probation. And um, your PhD research, research examined women's desistance from crime after prison from a gender responsive, trauma informed perspective. Um, now, there's a little known fact about uh, Madeline Petrillo. She is from Lancashire, but she's not Italian either. <laughs> um, but the Polish people, You'll be very interested to know that one of her hobbies is not hot yoga, it's pole dancing. <laughs> <laughs> really regret telling you that. <laughs> so, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inv inviting me to be here. I'm really sorry my university are too cheap to have allowed me to join the workshops over the past few days, which um, I'm really sorry about. Um, so what I'm going to talk about in this session is about resilience and women's desistance, in particular, how we build 
resilience to shame and stigma through trauma-informed practice. And this draws on the work of my PhD that John's just mentioned. Um, also, some of the research I've done on a trauma-informed group program that was rolled out across the women's prisons in England a few years ago. So I'm sort of bringing those two projects together to, uh, to look at shame resilience um, in trauma-informed practice. So, um, yeah, partly about how trauma creates shame and how this impacts on capacities to build resilience, but also, um, and maybe a little bit controversially, some of the ways women um, express resilience in the face of significant adversity. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to give some definitions and understandings of shame and how it impacts our self-concepts and relationships things that are, you'll have learned over the past few days, I'm sure are really important to building resilience. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how shame emerged as gendered in my research as well, because I think there were quite distinct gendered elements to it. Um, then I'll use the research I've done on the Healing Trauma Programme to look at how resilience man manifests in women and um, how trauma-informed interventions might help women build resilience. So I think most of you are probably familiar with principles of trauma-informed practice. Um, they're getting about now among criminal justice practitioners, but um, if you're not there up there, these are the ones I use to inform my work. So they're around safety, trust, collaboration, empowerment, voice and choice, peer support, and join on some of this stuff Jane's just been talking about, cultural, historical, and gender um, inclusivity. When we're looking at trauma-informed practice in organizations, these apply to everyone in the organization, those working there and those accessing services. And as again, as you'll probably know, trauma-informed practice is not about curing trauma. It's just a recognition that people accessing services are likely to have experienced trauma. So they're a way for organizations to ensure that they don't re-trigger um, trauma in their, in their clients or their staff. And you'll see that some of these principles are aligned with, um, I'm sure what are some of the ways you've been learning about how we build resilience. So through empathy, through building positive relationships, through emotional intelligence and peer support. The goal for trauma-informed services um, is that the whole organization and the whole system is trauma-informed, but we are a very long way from that in, um, in the justice system. However, um, there was an initiative that started in 2015 in England and Wales to roll out trauma-informed practice in women's prisons. And one part of, I, I can talk later about how that's gone if you're interested, but the one part of that that I'm going to be talking about is this healing trauma intervention. Um, that's just, it's a six session trauma informed group program. So Jane's are already explained a lot about how trauma impacts on, on um, resilience, really. Uh, what we know about women in the criminal justice system is that they experience extremely high levels of victimization. A high proportion of women in prisons and on probation um, experience some form of, of abuse or neglect as children, and then they often go on to experience very high levels of domestic abuse, sexual violence and exploitation bereavement and loss, particularly of children and through family separation in adulthood. So to even survive these experiences takes a really high level of resilience. But as the quote up there from Maston suggests, there's an assumption that our natural capacities for resilience can be uh, damaged by severe adversity. It says our capacity for resilience is the exception when people experience relational abuse. and. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but what I also want to suggest today is that some of the problem behaviours or maladapting coping mechanisms that we see in women's offending can be reframed as acts of resilience to profound shame that results from the relational abuse and trauma that they've experienced. And that a trauma-informed approach both recognises that and offers ways to 
harness this resilience in, in positive ways. So I'd just like you to take a minute to, I won't ask you to say, but um, to think about what shame feels like when you're, when you're experiencing it. These are two definitions of shame that I think will probably pick up on some of the feelings that just, just came into your heads when, when you were asked to, to think about shame. The first one is from uh, Brené Brown, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with her and her work, an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we're flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. And the second one is an acutely painful emotion that's typically accompanied by a sense of shrinking or being small and by a sense of worthlessness and powerlessness. So shame comprises these like really negative self-evaluations that don't just reflect bad behavior, but a spoiled identity that's unworthy of acceptance and belonging. It really erodes the person's sense of who they are and their ability to view themselves positively. So high levels of shame are a really significant challenge to the positive self-evaluations that are required for both successful desistance and to build resilience. And it's different from guilt in this way. So guilt is like, I did something bad, but shame is, I am bad. And that quote, the final quote from Kaufman um, really captures this, I think. Um, they say, a wound felt from the inside divided us both from ourselves and from one another. So building shame resilience is about developing connection back to the self and to other people. But it's not just an emotion. It's also got cognitive and reflective, reflexive components. And I'm gonna bring in a quote from one of the women who were participated in my research here, Adina. She says, I feel like if my family ever found out about the true me, they'd be ashamed, seriously. I think everything is just twice as bad now. I just feel ugly, I feel worthless. I feel like if people really knew me, they would know that I'm an ugly person. And I think these comments, you can see the emotional responses of self-hatred and feelings of worthlessness, but they're interacting with these co cognitions about the self as inferior and damaged in the eyes of others. And then they accumulate in this self-critique of like, if people knew me, then they'd think I was an ugly person. So you can see the three components of shame really there in, her, in Adina's comment. And it's, it starts to come out in what Adina was saying, but um, the real gendered character of shame, I think uh, became evident in the way the women spoke about shame as um, related to ideas of good womanhood. And again, this is something that Brené Brown talks about, that there's psychological, social, and cultural elements to shame. Um, and they're based on really narrow interpretations of what appropriate beh behavior is. So when women experience shame, it's inextricably linked to perceived failures to meet these ideals of good womanhood, these expectations of good womanhood, and particularly around areas of um, appearance and body image, sexuality, family, motherhood, parenting, speaking out and surviving trauma. And I think in Janelle's quote, you can, um, it, this really comes across again. She says, domestic violence is one thing, yeah, it takes away your self-esteem as a woman, especially like I've had a few miscarriages due to domestic violence, you know, you feel like you're not worth being a woman, like no one's ever going to love you. You don't, like, you don't ever feel pretty. You can have all the expensive makeup in the world. I could be standing next to Britney Spears and look better than her, but still feel ugly. Like you just don't feel like you belong. You're never comfortable no matter where you are. You, you just don't feel at home. So it's, I think this, um, Janelle's an example of how some of these stories, it's very, and reflections, it's very difficult to imagine them being stories that men could have as well. They, they do have this very gendered element to them. And the other part of the, shame I think that came across as particularly gendered was the physicality that the women 
use to describe their shame experiences. So you've already heard Adina and Janelle ex uh, express it as an ugliness. Um, Jill talks about prostitution as a dirty life, suggesting that she feels visibly soiled by her experiences. Alyssa and Katie described feeling like monsters, like completely inhuman. And all this is compounded by prison, as Misha says, the final quote on the slide, that she feels branded by prison. So prison's adding yet another physical stigma to these feelings of, uh, of shame. And this is where it gets controversial. So um, you'll, I, I, again, I'm sure you've talked in a lot over the past few days about how um, sort of trauma might come out in behavior. James just talked about it as well, that um, it emerges in harmful behaviors um, and that shame is often at the root of destructive behaviors like self-harm and substance use, sex work and outbursts of violence and aggression. But then when I was reflecting on these problem behaviours, what had really struck me from the women's stories, what I'd really noted was their incredible ability to survive all of this, that they kept being knocked down, but they'd get up again and again and again. And this made me start to think about harmful and offending related behaviours, not as dysfunctional coping mechanisms, but as small acts of resilience. And what was interesting about the way the women spoke about their self-harm and substance misuse and offending suggested that they were on occasion an expression of their agency and their autonomy. And it feels sort of incongruent to suggest that drug use or self-harm is an, an agentic act of resilience, but actually the women felt some of these behaviors had saved their lives. And um, Alice is one example of this, as she says, I used to hate myself, I used to self-harm my face, that's why I've got scars on my face. It's been related to drug use and from being raped because I didn't want to be pretty anymore. So, of course, her um, shame is really evident in that she's blaming herself as opposed to her abuser. Um, but at the same time, Alice's self-harm is very clearly a deliberate and intentional attempt to keep herself safe from further rape and to keep surviving. So in conceptualizations of resilience, survivor and survival can sometimes refer to like the lowest form of resilience, like you, you're, su you're surviving, but you're relying on really quite harmful behaviors to do so. But for the women I was working with, surviving felt really heroic. The survival aligned much more with like feminist interpretations of the word survival, where it celebrates the resilience of women who've endured prolonged violence and abuse and uh, survivor is used to jettison like negative connotations of the victim label. Now, obviously, and Jane's pointed this out as well already, that these manifestations of agency or resilience are, are massively problematic to women's well-being, but they do have a function in that they enabled women to feel like they were asserting some sort of control over their lives in the face of really highly restricted um, options. And then if we start to recognize these behaviors as resilience, we can start to see them as a strength and something that the resilience is there, we've just got to harness it and, and build on it. So uh, very quickly, <laughs> just noticed I'm running out of time. The, <laughs> healing trauma program um i really i noted down jane's quote about the cbt not not accounting for the visceral feelings of the lack of safety and um healing trauma does use some cbt approaches but together with a lot of other approaches as you can see up there to um help people understand the associations between the harm they've experienced and the uh, behaviors that are contributing to their um to their offending and um, some of the features of trauma-informed practice that were relevant to building shame resilience uh, really came out very obviously in women's like responses to the program. So in this example, you can see uh, principles of 
so, sorry, not that example, this example, you can see principles of safety, trust, empowerment, peer support in helping this participant overcome her shame. She says, I can't stress how much of a difference it made to feel not alone in these massive acts that have controlled your life and still control your life in so many behaviors. Just to know other people uh, have experienced, it just makes you feel like you could take your mask off and think I'm not alone. I don't have to be quiet. I don't have to be ashamed. I can just know from looking at someone, they've been through it, I've been through it, and we're going to get through it. It also helped the women develop a sense of self-confidence um, that enabled them to start to reflect on and express their emotions more openly. So as this person said, I feel like I'm more stronger and more confident in myself. Um, after doing the course, I feel like it's helped me gain more confidence to speak out. I used to hide away and bottle things up, but I don't anymore. I come and speak to people if I need to. And I think probably the most important thing in um, You've probably talked about this as well, is the power of the group in um, in this intervention. Like the women spoke so much about how important it was to have the group have that shared experience with the group. Um, like this person says, it's a brave first step as well, because I know um some people there definitely hadn't shared or said anything and never felt like they could or should, and the shame that comes with a lot of things silences you. And then to hear one person be brave enough, then it was like a domino effect. All of a sudden, everyone felt that empowered and that brave. So um, just to finish, like in, in all the interviews and focus groups I did, it was just really humbling to recognize that despite leading these very traumatic lives, the women were able to access this inner resilience and survive, even if it came out in, um, not the best way sometimes that this resilience is a quality that's in them despite their offending and is sometimes manifested through their offending and related behaviors and so i think recognizing those as manifestations of resilience and strength and building a way to support healing uh, um, a really important way to support women's desistance and janelle put this much uh, more eloquently than me she said I think even when you feel the lowest you can feel in life, there's always a little spark there inside all of us. It's just what brings it out. Thank you. You've shown your appreciation. Uh, I think those were two exceptional presentations, particularly at this late start, at late part of our. Uh, summer course together. Um, even when it's part of your job to stand up here in front of people is, a, is still quite a nerve wracking experience. And it's something you never ever get used to. You as managers will, uh, will know that or where you do public speaking. And that's particularly so when the subject you're speaking about is something that you feel passionately about and I think in our two speakers today, we've felt that passion and it's gone round the room. And it, as Jane was saying, it's visceral. It's visceral. Uh, and I think it all points to the importance of the jobs that we all do. Understanding and actually doing something and coming up with positives. And clearly there are even in the most damaging of damaged situations, there are things that we can do as human beings to uh, help each other, particularly professionally. If anyone feels that, uh, now I'm not going to uh, take a time for questions from the floor. It somehow doesn't feel quite right. But if you want to ask our speakers anything, They'll be around for uh, quite some time after this, uh, while they calm down. Not not hours, not hours. But they will be around, and um, particularly it might be helpful if you want to speak to each other about what you've heard. So once again, I'd like you to show your appreciation of two exceptional expert speakers, and uh, we all thank you very very much.
So go out and have a good time, but let's remember, let's be safe out there. <laughs> and we'll see you tomorrow morning.